And Professor Swaran Singh of the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi joins us on the U.S. elections. Uh, sir, welcome to the program. So many political observers have built this unpredictable race for the 47th president of the U.S. as the most consequential one in decades. Would you agree? Absolutely, Tanvi. I think it is the most televised uh, elections around the world, obviously making everyone uh, enormously interested in, uh, you know, moment-to-moment -moment developments that are happening. And as uh, Shavendu and Amrit uh, reporting from United States showed us, this is also perhaps unprecedented in terms of the security and caution in terms of training of election staff in how to de-escalate situations, how to, you know, report uh, in case there's any criminal activity and so on. So in many ways, uh, this is a uh, first time uh, kind of an election. But most interesting, of course, is the neck to neck, which again, both your reporters uh, mentioned neck to neck uh, competition that we are seeing. And you did mention uh, how, you know, three plus three votes uh, were divided equally mm. among two in the first uh, polling that took place, yeah. which fundamentally means that, you know, outcome of this election is going to be equally difficult to predict even after elections are uh, completed tomorrow. And in that sense, it could also involve litigation. I understand more than 100 cases, suits are all, already filed in courts uh, re regarding eligibility of voters and lists and so on. And, you know, particularly when margins are as low as 0.5%, uh, hmm. repeated recounts are going to happen. And then, of course, we also know that in uh, United States, unlike in India, it's not the national authority that controls how election process will proceed. It's the provinces, it's the states that will have different time schedules of uh, when to begin, when to end on uh, 5th of November. And again, counting, I understand about 80 million votes have already been cast, either through post or mail or through early voting, etc., etc. And some states allow that counting of early votes earlier than the election day. Others uh, want them to wait until the election day. Uh, you know, there are cases when the election counting has taken almost 10, 12 uh, days after election day is completed. So you know, fundamentally, it's going to be equally, you know, puzzle for maybe several days to come. Uh, though media would like to immediately try to, you know, insinuate and gesticulate what has happened in election uh, of 5th of November. But it's going to be interesting outcomes. And I think both candidates are almost equally, though Donald Trump has a slight edge apparently, but both are equally neck to neck. And, you know, either of them could be sitting in White House for the next five years. Okay, talking of the election campaign, which has now come to a close, uh, why was this U.S. presidential campaign so very bitter and so very vitriolic this time? I think, first of all, that uh, we are all worldwide increasingly familiar with the personality of uh, uh, former President Donald Trump, who, as you know, is saying that he's already won the election or he's going to announce or wants them to announce election outcomes on the evening of the election day. The tone and tenor, of course, uh, in some ways is also global trend where election speeches are becoming increasingly personalized. And we saw when suddenly in July, Joe Biden, President Joe Biden decided to withdraw. And then the whole Republican campaign has to recast itself because till then it was very personalized. It was focusing almost caricaturing uh, President Joe Biden, which he, of course, does with Kamala Harris also. And of course, in that sense, the harsh tone of uh, uh, both sides to some extent, because Democrats also need to respond to the tone and tenor that the Republicans have uh, presented. Uh, to some extent, that could be called uh, a trend which is becoming global in almost uh, several democracies around the world. But more specifically, I think it also is a, you know, could be called inflection point, a change in uh, the way elections are contested since mm. uh, uh, Donald Trump came into electioneering from 2016 onwards. Okay, should Donald Trump lose, how likely is it that he will claim that he was the victim of widespread fraud and challenge the results? I think that is very likely because he's already been one after another speeches uh, of his are mentioning uh, that uh, in case he loses, this will be a, because of the fraud and cheating that the other side is going to do. So that insinuation is already in place. It's not going to come later. Uh, but apparently, we will have to wait and watch. And that is why you see the kind of arrangements that your reports showed that are being made you mm. know, to take care of any hoodlums coming to disrupt any election process. Uh, and of course, following election day also, there's going to be enormous uh, focus on ensuring peace and stability in, in American society, uh, not to see that 
you know, January 6 of 2021 is repeated again, hmm. which of course we still have time. Uh, but yes, there is enormous uh, expectation, anticipation that in case, as your question is, uh, uh, candidate Donald Trump loses election, uh, it's very likely that there could be, you know, disruptions uh, in the United States. Now, to what scale and speed disruptions happen, that of course remains a question to be discussed okay. uh, as we move into this. But I think, yes, that concern is really genuine. Okay. Should Kamala Harris win, she will make history as the first U.S. woman president. What does that do, if anything, for the American woman and for the election of woman presidents in the U.S. in the years ahead? I think the world has increasingly, for about the last three to four decades, become increasingly conscious of gender mainstreaming. And the United States, being the leading nation in the international community, has this opportunity to you know, set the record straight and you know, ensure that the woman, for the first time, you know, takes over presidency and then sits in the White House for the next four years. Uh, since the competition is neck-to-neck -neck competition, I think that element of taking this opportunity, historic opportunity, to see the first woman becoming the president of the United States is also going to weigh in. And I noticed that already several women's organizations have come out in public saying that this is our opportunity and women should particularly, and of course men as well, should support and you know rectify that record which now increasingly the world begins to look at as American conservatism as a social uh, trait or social uh, tendency. Because whenever women tried, they have not been successful in taking, you know, presidency ever earlier. Uh, twice earlier attempts have been made. Hillary Clinton was a very strong candidate. And we know that popular vote was in her favor. Hmm. And you know, despite that, she couldn't become the president of the United States. So I think Kamala Harris, apart from being younger compared to you know, President, the former President Donald Trump, uh, has also this enormous advantage of being a person of color. And of course, also being the woman who's very articulate in, uh, in, in many ways also. Okay. So she's been able to focus much more on issues than caricaturing the opponent. Interestingly, Kamala Harris has not made her gender a major talking point in her election campaign. Rather, she has chosen to highlight policy. Why do you think she has taken such a stance? I think that would also be seen as uh, revealing certain amount of uh, weakness in our leadership. Uh, if you're trying to make gender as your strong point, because she wants to present herself as a national leader who can give direction to where you know she wants to take United States in coming four years. So in that sense, I think she is, there's also this whole debate on, you know, beyond the two genders, the other genders are also in debate. And we have seen President, uh, former President Donald Trump being unusually harsh on some of those uh, identities in that sense. So she is trying to, you know, complete the whole spectrum of identities, not just man and woman, male or female. And therefore, I think it's important for her not to really uh, highlight her being a, a woman, therefore, because she wants to present herself as a leader for all identities and all genders in the United States. Hmm. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Swaran Singh. I request you to stay on with us in the show uh, as we tell our viewers that uh, Americans are preparing to vote for the election day. It will be a hectic Super Tuesday, of course, not just in the United States of America, but for millions of viewers worldwide. So officials are calling uh, for patience and... Uh,